Good morning and welcome. Sorry about that. Let me just get this straight over there. There you go. Okay. Um, today is uh, Wednesday, March 17th, and uh, we are starting a conversation on the Jew on Jewish holidays or the Jewish calendar. Um, you know, it's one of those conversations that you um, you always want to have. You have ideas that are about the holiday. You have ideas about Jewish view of time, but you don't really uh, concretize them. And I, what I want to do over the next couple of weeks is kind of concretize these ideas so that we all walk away with the ability of um, de developing a deeper understanding, appreciation for um, the Jewish view of time and our holidays in general. And I'm going to try to contrast them a little bit and help you understand how they're different than other holidays that we celebrate. So, you know, um, when we talk about historic dates, um, those dates are there to help us create some kind of a footpath through our heritage. Um, every generation experience them, experiences these uh, different um, stepping stones. Um, and uh, they're constantly going through a, a time. They're a recollection of our heritage. Um, and, um, you know, it's a very clear uh, idea that, you know, we celebrate something that happened in the past. Now, it's interesting, before 1971, Washington's birthday was one of the nine U.S. holidays that were celebrated on dates which year after year fell out on different days of the week. So then, I'm not sure if you know this, they started tinkering around with the uh, holidays. The 19th U.S. Congress in 1968 determined that they were going to create a uniform system of federal Monday holidays. Of course, Congress voted uh, to shift three of these holidays to Mondays, and they expanded that by four, uh, creating a new holiday called Columbus Day. Now, Washington's birthday was supposed, was, uh, was uprooted from its fixed date, which was February 22nd, and it was moved to the third Monday in February, followed by Memorial Day being relocated from the last day of May to the last day in Monday. Okay, um, they, these new holidays, uh, you know, Columbus Day was also put in the second Monday in October. Uh, all of these things were done so we could have longer weekends, not because we could really celebrate any of these holidays, but like if you're gonna have a holiday, at least tied into the weekends, so we get a longer weekend. Now, in Judaism, the establishment of a historic holiday, right, can, you know, it's, it's, it's established and therefore it cannot be arbitrarily positioned or moved to accommodate longer vacations. Can't do that. The Jewish holiday, it does not just um, honor um, heritage, okay? Shabbat, the festivals, these days themselves are our heritage, but more importantly, they're infused with this intrinsic holiness spirituality, opportunity for tremendous personal growth. So the goal of this series is to kind of explore the meaning and observance of Shabbat, the Jewish holidays, the festivals. Um, let's try to understand how these uh, natural uh, occasions that happen over and over for us uh, are connected to our heritage and how we're connected to the heritage as well. So let's begin with the talk, a discussion on time, okay? The first concept you have to clarify is what is the Jewish view on time, okay? You can't have a discussion of milestones or a calendar without understanding that Jewish holidays don't merely commemorate events in the past. Now, Judaism does not look at time as a static linear progression that follows from one moment to the next, right? There's always a connection. So for most uh, systems of time. You have a, a calendar, that's linear, right? You have a holiday you celebrate over here, a, a year passes by and you celebrate it again and again and again and again. This is not our view of time. We don't believe in a linear progression of time, but rather Judaism's view of time is a cyclical dimension, a medium through which we move just as we move through space. Like we're moving through time as opposed to time just moving. There's a very big difference. Rabbi Dessler says the time doesn't pass us by, but we move through it. I have a, um, a calendar here. I wonder if I could share my screen with you guys. Hold on a second. I can. Voila. 
Okay, so um, this is the Jewish calendar and the Jewish view of time. If anyone wants this, I'm happy to send it to you. Um, okay, so basically what you're looking at is a cyclical view of time. These are all of our holidays. They run around in a circle, circle over and over again. So imagine right now, I am moving in this circle. I'm starting over here. The reason why we're having this conversation, by the way, is because Rosh Chodesh, we just celebrated. Rosh Chodesh Nisan is the first day of the new calendar year. And therefore, what we're celebrating right now is the beginning of the calendar. So Rosh Chodesh Nisan, right over here, this little box is the box that represents the beginning of time. And we're going to move from Nisan, Adar, Shvat. I'm going to go all the way around. And the reason why this is important is because this is moving through us. We're at the center. And uh, we're always, a, a, even if we're standing still, time is moving through us. Now, this is important because um, it is unique in the sense that our holidays are not just moments where we stop and uh, celebrate a unique moment in time, but rather um, when we go through this weekly cycle, right, and we meet Shabbat once a week, right, we're doing that. But at the same time, we're also traveling through a yearly cycle, okay? And then in that yearly cycle, we pass through the festivals and the holidays. Now, what's interesting is that the word for, uh, for zman, time, zman also means prepared. Every moment in time has been prepared by God for us to utilize to achieve um, individual and communal goals. The Maharal writes this in the beginning of his introduction to the Derek Chaim. He says that everything is contingent on time and each thing has its own particular time. And he quotes a verse that everything, the famous verse that everything had a kol yeshman right? That's a quote from uh, um, Mishle, right? No, Kohelet. Everything has its season uh, and there is a time for everything. Now, Chachamim tell us there is nothing that does not have a particular place, a particular uh, time. And there's no man who doesn't have a particular time. And that from this, we learn that everything has a special time. We say like this, You don't have a, uh, there's no such thing as no place. And you don't have a thing that a person has no time. You'll see though, he says, is Maharal, Everything has a unique time. It's very important. So there's two things. You have space and time, right? You have space that I travel through. Okay. You have this, uh, we'll use this diagram over here to try to explain and uh, make this a little bit more um, understandable. Of course, it's dead, so I can't use it. <laughs> oh, those kids, those meddling kids using dad's stuff and not recharging his iPad. All right, so forget about that. Um, you have a moment in time, it looks like this. This is space, okay? There's nothing in it, all right? What is time? Time. is us moving through space, okay? Time is my ability to measure my movement from here to here, that's what time is. If there's no space, there's no time. Time and space are interwoven, but we don't think of time linearly. We think of time cyclically, which means that if I was to draw time for us, it would kind of look like this, okay? This is a very poor, rendition of what time would look like. We're constantly going through time or that's use a sheet of paper and turn this into a proper, you know, um, helix to that time would look like this. Time would look like that. Constant, a constant movement that we're constantly going through over and over and over again. The difference is that it's layered. So as I'm moving through the cycle, I'm going up and up and up and up and up and up. Now, why is that uniquely different than how I celebrate um, Washington's birthday. Why is that different? It's different because it allow, what, what's happening is that I'm not just moving through this moment, I'm moving away from this moment in time, I'm re-experiencing that moment in time. And therefore, Chachamim tell us that as we travel through our an annual cycle, we meet all kinds of festivals along the way, right? And each, each, each particular uh, uh, festival, 
has a is a unique meeting in time that we're supposed to walk away with something from that particular meeting in time, right? So Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. What is this unique meeting every year? Okay, so each holiday has a spiritual gift to it, right? And each holiday gives us a spe- has a special unique ability of giving us inspiration. That is what we call a gift, okay? It's the essence of what every holiday is. Every holiday is there to give you something unique. Okay, so how do we determine the difference between the essence of uh, Sukkot from, uh, you know, uh, Pesach? Well, the rabbis wrote prayers, and each one of the prayers help us define what the actual holiday's gift is. So Sukkot is Zman Simchatenu. It's a time of our joy. Passover is called Zman Cherotenu, the time of our freedom. Shavuot is called Zman Matan Toratenu, the time that we receive the Torah. Now, these characterizations capture the essence of the festival. So for example, if Passover is a time of freedom, it was then that the Jewish people were taken out of Egypt after 210 years of hard labor and bondage, and they were able to become a nation that would receive God's Torah. We, as Jews, every Passover, relive that freedom every year, both on an individual level and on a national level. Okay, and how do we do this? We do this through the observance of mitzvot, the mitzvot of Pesach, of Passover, which give us the strength to overcome the more basic inclinations and free our unique energy that is unlocked during this particular time of year. How do we do that? It's through our service of God. That's how we bring it about. So Passover is called the time of our freedom, not because historically um, it was the time where we came free. It's not because historically it's a time that, you know, the Egyptian slavery ended, but rather because the spiritual, there's a spiritual reality called freedom. And it's rooted in this particular time of the year. There is no other time of the year we could have been freed. The only month that we could have achieved freedom is the month of Nisan. Now, this is what we're, we, we say in Haggadah, that every person must see themselves as if they personally left Egypt on the night of Pesach. That's what we're trying to accomplish. How do you do that? Well, you got to use your imagination. Now, what is true for Passover is no less true for each of the other uh, Jewish festivals in the calendar. So when we call um, we call the holidays Eidot, what is an Eida? It's a testimony. Why? Because the holidays testify to us regarding the nature of the spiritual energy rooted in the respective season. Just as Passover gives us an encounter with freedom, so too does Shavuot offer an experience of revelation, Rosh Hashanah of judgment, Sukkot of joy, okay? Now, the the holidays, again, are not just there, Stam, for us to go ahead and, uh, you know, uh, just party. They're there to help us work through our unique circumstances to become greater human beings. So, you have rabbinic holidays that are not uh, Torah holidays. So I understand Torah holidays, but how do you explain rabbinic holidays? Purim and Hanukkah are both rabbinic in nature, and they follow exactly the same pattern, right? When the Chachamim instituted the festivals and the mitzvot that were performed on those particular dates and time, our Chachamim revealed to us that there's a special energy of spiritual force that's inherent in those times, okay? And um, so he's so so they understood the rabbis when they put these holidays together, they align their minds with the thoughts of God. And for this reason, we are obligated to say that um, we're fulfilling, we're able to say that we're filling God's will on these holidays. How do we make a bracha? Bracha tashem, you know, that, that blessed are you, the Lord, that you have commanded me to recite the Megillah or light the candles when God never said those things. It's not because the rabbis were lying, it's because they were able to use a deeper understanding of how God operates the calendar and weave in those ideas into the actual calendar itself. So for example, let's look at the holidays themselves. All right, I'm gonna summarize them for you. What is Shabbat? Shabbat is the consecration of life. That's what Shabbat is. We're celebrating the consecration of life. Uh, Passover is the uh, physical creation of the Jewish people 
and the bond of its destiny and duty throughout every single generation. Shavuot is the spiritual creation of the Jewish people and the divine origin of Jewish teachings and way of life. Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, that is the examination of life. Sukkot, physical survival of the Jewish people in the land of Israel, a very deep appreciation of God. Shmini Atzeret, right, is the spiritual survival of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. Purim, physical survival, okay, exile, um, reaffirming our faith in God, um, in God's unseen protection. Hanukkah, spiritual survival of the Jewish people um, in exile, affirming our faith in God's uh, preservation of the spiritual aspects of the Jewish people. Each of the spiritual uh, dimensions listed above, these are all treasures. The festivals add a necessary dimension to a complete picture of Jewish life. Our lives are therefore in, enwrapped by the joy of Purim and tempered by the morning of Tisha B'Av. They are inspired by the Teshuvah of Yom Kippur and filled with the uh, trepidation of Rosh Hashanah, enlightened by the perspective of Hanukkah and motivated by the opportunity of, uh, of Shavuot. All are necessary and each has its unique time. Everything has its season and there's a time for everything under the sun. So it's not just a repetitive, ever revolving cycle encounter same moment of judgment and joy each year, right? This, the, remember, it's cyclical, and therefore it's also, but it's, it's cyclical, right? But on some level, it's also linear. So there's these two things. There's something called the Shana, which means repetition. And you also have the Chodesh, which means something that is new. So we have these two different views of time, Chodesh and Shana. On the one hand, some things are pegged into reality and other things are there to allow us to renew ourselves. So how do we do this? We, we use both. You see, everything that we do on a day-to-day -day basis is packed into time. Are, am I bored? Am I excited? Am I just reliving every single moment of the past? Can I not change? Am I stuck in a cycle? And the answer is no, you are not stuck in the cycle. And yes, you can change everything in the past. How do we do this? The holidays themselves are a meeting point with God a meeting point with mankind and God, a meeting point where, we're, where we just, we recognize that we're in a repetitive loop, but we also recognize the time that we're in is unique and it allows us to break free from the mental time bondage that we experience in our day-to-day -day lives. So when we have Birkat HaChodesh, the mitzvah of sanctifying the new moon, that transforms our people from passive passengers through time into the drivers of its spiritual force. By having a hand in determining when God will infuse the calendar with the relevant spiritual energies of the Moadim, we ourselves come to sanctify time. That's what we do. And when we stay in our blessing at each fest festival, blessed are you, the Lord, our God, who sanctifies time, the Israel and its times, we are, what we are also doing is blessing God for giving us the ability to sanctify it in this time itself. So what is the Jewish view of time? The Jewish view of time is the understanding that time is repetitive, but we have a power of actualizing its unique power by recognizing that the past does not define the present and we have the power of overcoming the mundane repetitiveness of, of life and nature. So it's what are, what are we today's Wednesday? We're like, we're like almost one and a half weeks away. We're one and a half weeks away from Pesach, right? If this holiday that's coming up, right? If you want to be able to tap into that unique energy of freedom, my question to you, my friends is, what are you doing to prepare for that freedom, right? What make the, the uh, freedom of this country, the founding forefathers of this country were so special because they weren't just slaves trying to break free from their government. They were hyper intellectuals, people who were refining their character, who understood that the way in which you could really appreciate freedom is the freedom of the mind. The freedom that the family forefathers of this country brought us 
was a freedom to understand that with the intellect, we're able to achieve real freedom. It's not just the ability to go out and do what you want. Oh, I'm not going to wear a mask anymore. I can't handle it anymore. I can't take it, right? That is uh, not taking away your freedom. It's a, it's a mindset, right? It's your mindset. If you're able to free your mind, you're able to achieve real freedom, which is why I believe historically, I'm not, I don't believe this is a fact, actually, historically, any group of people that tried overthrowing our government, when that group that want to overthrow the higher powers were coming from a lower social class or a lower intellectual class, the freedoms they brought never lasted. Because freedom from something is great, but freedom to what? What are you getting, where, where are you moving that freedom to? So as we go through these uh, next, these, this week and next week, I'll, I'll do a double click on the holiday again and show you how the whole entire holiday itself is a relationship between man and God, a wedding. But in terms of Pesach itself, in order for you to be able to achieve real freedom, you have to be able to work through your midot. So what do we do? We get rid of chametz in our lives, right? Why? The chametz represents the bloated nature that we have. Chametz represents the fact that I have ego. And therefore, we live for a week without any chametz. Nothing can blow me up. Nothing can go ahead and remove me from the deeper understanding of, 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 of my real freedom, freedom coming from me working through my actual character traits. So how do I do that? Well, okay, so the first on Thursday night, not this Thursday, but next Thursday night, you're going to take out something called Bedikat Chametz. You're going to have 10 pieces of bread. You can throw them around your house. And most people are going to take them and they're going to find them. They're going to get their little candle and their little feather and their, and their little wooden spoon, which no one uses today. You have a flashlight, whatever you're getting it. You collect them and that's it. Tomorrow, you, no, Friday morning, you burn them. The whole purpose of that search is to think of yourself as a palace. And just like you need to search through the crevices of your home for the chametz that, that uh, will, would render your Passover unkosher, you need to search through your mind the memory palace of your mind, of your soul, and remove the chametz that's standing in there that will prevent you from achieving, experiencing true freedom. That is what the holiday is really about, not the food, not just the sederim. The sederim are important because what we're trying to do with the seder is what? Teach our children to question, teach our children to, to think, teach our children to, be, uh, to recognize that real beauty comes from... Uh, uh, real beauty comes from the uh, understanding that uh, life is all about achieving a level of inner perfection, a life of inner greatness, not a world where we're just, you know, doing the same thing over and over again. It's true, we have the soft masas, and, and it's true that they're delicious, but the soft masas don't rise. The soft masas still stay flat. And the whole purpose of the holiday is for us to achieve, achieve real freedom. And the only way that can happen is through our ability to penetrate our soul. I remove all things. Everything that we do on Passover is a meditation to get into the innermost parts of our brain and our heart, our soul. That's what holds us back from being free. So may we, God willing, be blessed with true freedom, the ability of recognizing that our egos get in the way of our uh, greatness, our freedom, and more importantly, that we're able to use this meeting point in time so that we can connect to the Almighty and ourselves in the most profound way. Have an amazing week. Chag Sameach, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. It's Wednesday. We can say it already.